Well, this is actually a perfect session for homecoming week, right? We've got the two of you coming back to Stanford to share some of your insights. Um, I want to formally introduce Steve Garrity and Juliet Rothenberg. Uh, Steve graduated in 2004 and Juliet in 2007. So that's quite a long time ago. And But only a few years ago, it feels like you were sitting in this audience right here um, listing the speakers who are on this stage. So maybe you could give us a little snapshot of what you've done since you were sitting here as a student until you're sitting here on the stage with me. Steve, you want to start? Sure. Um, we were literally just talking about that as we walked on, that it was a strange feeling to be walking onto the stage from, <clears throat> from this direction. Um, but uh, so like Selena said, I graduated uh, computer science in 04, 05, uh, went on to Microsoft. Actually, I went to a startup first called Fortify, uh, doing security work, uh, went on to Microsoft for a while as a software engineer and a product manager, and then started uh, my own company with another uh, Mayfield fellow alum, Clara Shai. Uh, called Hearsay, and that is going to this day. I stepped back from my day-to-day -day job last year there, so I'm still on the board, but I took a year off and have just been playing, which has been amazing. And now I'm working on a couple of new ideas, so there'll be another company sometime here in the future. Great. And Juliet. So I actually used to help TA this class, so it's particularly interesting for me because I'm used to being up here saying, hey, remember to turn in your papers and sure. remember to sign up for dinner and that type of thing. So it's it's fun to be able to take a different angle on it. Uh, and then I majored in, I started out in management science and engineering, wanted to focus more on energy. So designed my own major in energy strategy and engineering. And then went off to law school uh, from an engineering degree. Went to Harvard, spent three years there. Uh, you could say started a company with some folks at MIT, incorporated a science project might be a more appropriate term. Uh, and then went uh, to become a software product manager at Opower, which was an energy efficiency company. Uh, then went to the Google team that incubated Sidewalk Labs, Google's urban innovation arm. From there, went to Waymo, where I spent three years and launched our early rider program in Phoenix, which is Waymo's first experience with external riders in the cars. And then now I'm at DeepMind, as Tina said. Uh, I'm working on uh, AI for good, uh, particularly focused around energy. So the team is uh, the team that used uh, DeepMind's AI to reduce data center cooling energy consumption by 30 to 40 percent. You know what really strikes me uh, about your backgrounds is it's only 11 years and 14 years since you were here at Stanford. And yet you've done all these different things. You know, often students are getting out of school and they're super worried about what's the first thing they're going to do. And you realize maybe some of those first things, like your incorporated science project, you know, ends up falling off your resume, you know, to not really worry mm -hmm. about it. But what we want to focus on today is kind of a provocative topic. And the topic is finding your superpower. Now, you know, people are often trying to find their passions and find their place in the world, but we thought it would be interesting to look at it through the lens of finding your superpower. And so when I ask that question to each of you, what does that actually mean? What is, what is it to have a superpower? So when I think of superpower, and when, when you first invited us to this talk, I thought, oh crap, now I need to find out what my superpower <laughs> is. Uh, but when I, when I stepped back and thought about it, I thought, you know, what is it the skill that you uniquely bring to the table? And Tina, I really appreciate LEAP and its focus on soft skills, because as students, it's so easy to think of a superpower as an individual effort. Right? It is, what am I great at? What am I a rock star at? Where am I going to get you know, constant A pluses? And what could I get a PhD in and that type of thing? But as you get more and more out into the world, it's, what is the unique skill that I bring to a team? And where will I be best when complemented by other members of the team? And I think within that, then, it's, what you, what you uniquely bring to do, and unique means a couple of things. I think it means you enjoy doing it, right? You should enjoy your superpower and be really passionate about it. And then the other one is um, that other people should praise you for it, uh, meaning that they value it and that it's a valuable thing to bring to others as well. So when I think of superpower, that's how I break it down. Great. What do you think? Um, I, I generally agree with everything Juliet said. I think when I was when you, when you invited us, my first thought was like, oh yeah, maybe this talk will help me figure out what my superpower <laughs> is. So I'm still trying to find it. But um, to me, the superpower is really something about what can you do uh, significantly better than most people around you. And this is like, what's the thing that you? I think there's a couple companies that call it. What do you spike on? Uh, is a term I've heard a lot. But it's classically to me, it's it's what do you do? that you can create an outsized impact more quickly. And so I think like computer science, you talk about this a lot, where like the 10x engineer, 
right? Like the best engineers are 10x more mm -hmm. effective, not 2x, mm -hmm. which I think is a really interesting shift from a world where uh, if you get into you know, all the AI taking jobs conversation at some point, but like physical strength is one of those things that this, the fastest, fastest person in the world is 2x faster than everybody in this room, not 10x faster. But the smartest person at a given, mm -hmm. whether it's a machine learning problem or literature potentially, right? Anything intellectual is actually, the distribution looks very different. And you as a superpower might, you having a superpower might be 10x more effective versus 10%. Well, so that's really interesting. Does that mean that, does everyone have a superpower? I mean, is it that, okay, we all have something that we do better than other people that we're uniquely qualified to do? What do you think? And, and also, as part of that, do you, is a superpower something that's innate or is it something you build? Can you decide I'm going to be a superpower in computing or in literature or whatever other topic? So one of my favorite quotes is sometimes attributed to Einstein, although the uh, internet disagrees with whether he actually said it or not. Uh, and it's, everybody is a genius, but if a fish spends its entire life trying to climb a tree, it will think it's stupid. And I, that, for me, resonates so much, because I think that we all have these innate abilities. And there are people who are really talented and can see them. And hopefully, one of those people becomes a mentor of yours or a manager throughout your life and puts you in a position where you can then exercise and build on that superpower. Uh, and there are things that will inherently not be your superpower, right? Like my mom wanted to have a professional tennis player as a child. And I was born and she looked at the size of my shoulders and she said, well, there goes that dream. And so there are things that you can't do and there are things that you will be good at. And hopefully there will be people who encourage you along the way who can see the things that you are great at. Yeah, I think the optimist in me agrees and says everybody has a superpower and it's a matter of finding it. And, and there's a separate question of, is it? valuable? Does the market value it? Mm. Um, I, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but I hope it's true. I think your second question about can you choose a superpower to develop, um, again, the optimist in me would like to believe that yes, you can, but I tend to lean, my intuition says more, it's something that you are inherently good at that you choose to focus on. Um, because you enjoy it, whatever, it just comes easily. When I think of most people I know or, or superpowers that I can identify in friends of mine, they're often things that they don't think are very hard. And you're like, you are exceptionally talented at this particular thing. And they're like, really? Like, I, I don't, I, I just thought it was easy. You know, it's mm. funny because when I uh, ran my first company, I had this experience where everybody thought they were doing the easy job. And it was fascinating because you looked around and was like, oh my gosh, you think that's easy? To me, that would be really hard. Mm. And I think that's actually, actually really great when you have a team where everyone is playing to their superpowers and their strengths, and then everybody feels like they're doing the easy job. So I'm curious, I, I, I wonder if, have you figured out at this age what your superpower is and at what what is it, and when did you figure out what it was? Was it something when you were 10 years old, you go, you know what, this is what I need to be doing, or was it 20, or was it 25, or 30, or 50? You know, you're not 50. But <laughs> the point is, you know, at what point do you figure it out, and have you figured it out? So, yeah, please go. I, I think the, 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 we were talking about this earlier, the, the one that comes to mind for me as what I think I eventually discovered is a superpower, it wasn't obvious to me at first, is uh, it's either like my endurance or my pain tolerance, which is I will just keep going. And long after everybody thinks that it's worth like stopping or like it's, you give up or whatever, um, it's to me it's kind of like, no, you just keep going until you're done with it. And at first that was just kind of a normal part of what I was around. I, when I uh, came to Stanford, I walked on to the crew team, not because I was any good at crew, but because they needed people who were tall. And somebody decided that six feet was tall enough because the team didn't have anybody that was that tall. And so I started rowing, and it, it, the first thing you learn about crew, and no offense to any actual um, rowers in the room, crew is not a skill sport. Um, you basically pull, and then you slide forward. And you pull, and you slide. There's no like, hand-eye coordination involved. There's no <laughs> tactics. It, there, there are tactics if you're a coxswain. There's a very little bit of skill if you're stroke, because you've got to be very consistent. But everybody else in the back of the boat is just literally pull on the oar as hard as you freaking can. And that's really it. You can teach anybody to row in about a day. And then the rest of it is how hard are you willing to push yourself and you know how small does that pinpoint of light get before you black out. <laughs> and that was very natural to me. Freshman year where I was like, oh yeah, this is great. We're just gonna row and row and row and row. And then you you know, puke into the trash can on the side of the earth. <laughs> and it was like, that's crazy. And, yeah, that seemed normal to me. And over time I realized that in many parts of my life, whether it was um, athletics. I, I'm not built this. I don't look like this, but I'm an endurance runner. 
Um, and I just enjoy running long distances. And it's because I don't give up. It's not because I'm fast. I don't ever win. But I just don't stop going. And then you get into startups. And one of the biggest things I think, uh, Paul Graham, I think, said this, although, again, I'm not sure if the internet would agree. Um, startups don't die because they run out of money. Startups die because the founders run out of energy. And I think it's very true. Like, you just keep going, keep going, keep going. So at first it was obvious. At first it was just, that's how I work. Over time I've realized I think that's somewhat weird and unusual. And it's a superpower. Which maybe makes it a superpower. Yeah, great. Okay, so Julie, what's your superpower? So my, my story is a little bit different. I uh, came upon what my superpower was when someone told me, that they used the word superpower a few years ago. And, and I reflected on it, and I thought, yeah, you know, this might be right. Um, it was when I was at Waymo, uh, and someone told me, you know, you learn really fast, and you absorb new information, and it doesn't matter what type of information that is. And I, and I thought about it, and, and I realized, yes, that is what I like to do. You know, I got an engineering degree, and then I went off to law school, and I enjoyed that. And then I decided, you know, screw all of this. My engineering was not software. I didn't take any CS classes in college. And I said, you know what, I'm going to learn to be a software PM um, and go, go down this route and work in an entirely different industry. And then there were moments where I would pivot and do biz dev and product definition in new industries that I had never learned anything about before. And I would... You know, be comfortable speaking with world experts on that very quickly. There was one summer when I was at the Department of Energy, and I sat down. It was a summer internship. I sat down at my desk, and they said, OK, great. Your job for the summer is this aspect of Chinese energy policy. And you know, we've got a call in a few hours with one of the world leading experts on it. Don't worry about it. You can just start, and you can ask questions. And so I said, OK, great. I got three hours. Let's see how fast I can go. And I read everything I possibly could on on the policy, and by the end of those three hours, I knew basically as much as the person on the call did. Uh, and it, when someone reflected that back to me, that it is my ability to learn really fast and come up to speed really fast and get kind of the 80-20 of what is it that I really need to understand and what's the part that I don't need to understand that someone else can contribute, that was really gratifying to me and helped me understand, too, the types of roles that I should be in. So Steve, you mentioned, like, hey, I'm great at endurance. This fits really well with startups. For me, because I'm great at learning fast, it's really good for cross-functional roles. And so product is actually a great role for me because I get to work with teams of engineers on designing our technical uh, infrastructure. I get to work with UX designers on what does the user experience actually look like and how do we base that on user research? How do we base that on design principles? I get to work with legal teams on regulation and on contracts. I get to work with salespeople on deals. And that, for me, is really fun and energizing and doesn't feel, like you were saying, it doesn't feel like hard work because it's, oh good, there's something else to sink my teeth into. And if you made me do it 100% of the time, I would disengage and, and be a lot less excited than if I get to sprinkle around in a lot of different areas. So do you, once you figure out what you're really good at and you know, your superpower, do you have to keep polishing it? I mean, is this something you say, you know what, um, all right, I'm really good at endurance. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really double down on that and focus on my endurance, or I'm really good at learning things fast, or I'm good at creative problem solving, or I'm good at whatever it is, and, and then sort of say, hey, I'm going to spend a lot of time working to get even better? Or do you just take it for granted and go, OK, that's just the way I work? I personally think it's something that you'll want to work at, right? Because whatever you're doing, in theory, you're, you're working on something. And if I were in a role where I weren't leveraging something that I'm strong at, I think I would feel pretty demoralized and like I wasn't contributing as much as I could. And so I think inherently, insofar as, as you're working on something, you should be leveraging that superpower. And that will be polishing it and growing it over time. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think it's implicit. Like, I don't think you got to work on it. I think you just. You love it. You go do it more. And the more you do it, the better you get. It's all practice. It's just practice. So I, I'm curious, though. There's always this tension between do you um, play to your strengths or do you support your weaknesses? Or do you say, these are my weaknesses, and I'm going to go surround myself with people who compliment me? How do, you, how do you think about that for yourself and for your team? I mean, if there's something I'm not good at, should I go, I actually have to go learn this and get better? Or do I go, I'll never be good at that. I just have to have people around me who help out. I think it's an and. Uh, so for me, it's I want to surround myself with people who are great at things that are not my core strengths. And I want to consciously be watching them. And if we have a relationship with enough trust, which hopefully if you're working closely on a team with people, you do, then I'll say, Steve, hey, you're really great at this thing. 
it's something I'm working on. Can you coach me on it? Can you tell me how you think about it? Can you give me opportunities to test this out? And that way, I'm not letting the team down because Steve's there to catch me when I you know, do a face plant. And I'm also, I, I'm getting to learn as fast as I can from Steve. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's right. I think, I tend to think of it as a, sl a slightly different uh, metric, which is how critical um, is this weakness to me and how much do I really need, like how much is it hurting me versus how much do I just not care about it? And so if it's a really critical weakness that is impeding your progress in whatever you're trying to make progress against, whether it's your career or a relationship or you know a sport or whatever it is, um, if it's killing you, you've got to go work on it. And you can't just, there are some things you can't accept as weaknesses and still continue to be successful in what you're trying to do. And then there are some things where it's not that big of a deal. It's easy. It's an easy skill to go recruit um, outsource or to outsource to somebody right. um, or, or also just something that like you just don't care that much about. Like you don't want to learn. I'm a big believer in what Julia said earlier, which is you tend to learn the things that you enjoy. And so if you don't enjoy it and it's not killing you, just ignore it. Work around it and just be aware of it. Mm -hmm. Right, and find other people who are going to fill it. in the gaps. So I'm so fascinated by something you and I had a conversation about a year ago about um, your thoughts on success. And you told me the story about the messages you tell the people on your team about doing 1% better each day. And it really resonated with me, and especially around the idea of being viewed as a superpower. Because you often don't see those 1% things that people do. Can you, can you describe it? Because I thought it was so brilliant and insightful. Yeah, there's this, uh, I, I have no idea where I found this or heard it, uh, but I liked it so much I stole it. And one of our uh, very talented designers at Hearson made these awesome posters for our office that say 1.01 um, .01 to the 365 power is 38, and 0 0.99 to the 365 power is Point yeah, point zero point zero two, mm -hmm. and the point of it obviously being if you make yourself one percent better at something every day of the year, you're thirty eight times better, uh, and obviously if you slip, you're basically zero. Um, and I really like that because it gets to this kind of idea of iterative improvements, which for so many things in life, not everything, right? There's always sort of the discontinuous changes, but there's a lot of things that you can just if you're one percent better every day. It's amazing how much progress you make. And so if you can just iterate through things and figure out how to break it up into, I don't have to move the mountain, right? Because it's really hard to get started on moving the mountain. It's really easy to sit there and say like, ah, it's really big, I'll do it tomorrow. If you can find a way to do it very simply today and just make a tiny bit of progress, it, it's compound interest, right? Like it's the thing that you know your parents told you 10 years ago when you first got a checking account, right? Compound interest wins and it just puts it into motion. Yeah, it's, I think it's really powerful to think about those, you know, one percent things you can do each day that have a huge compounding effect. What do you What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to think about what a one percent. When I when I, when I sort of heard about this, I was wondering what what would a one percent action be, right? Like, or what would a one percent domain be? So, say that the area that you want to focus on is. It's engineering, for example, like is one percent like you know learning a new language or getting code review by someone or tackling a new problem or just trying figuring out how to operationalize it. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. Um, I think in in the engineering example, see if I can come up with some one percent things. Um, if you're trying to become a better software engineer, right, the one percent thing might be it's not picking up a new language in a given day, but it might just be literally picking up one new sort of library or one new design pattern or what, just mm -hmm. one little thing. The, the, the example I would give, I often give when I'm asked about this in terms of specific things is, it's like, it's keyboard shortcuts for email. If you don't already use keyboard shortcuts for email, learn them tonight. It will take you five or 10 minutes and it will make you 10 minutes faster every day for the rest of your life. And it's 10 minutes that you get back, right? Um, it's like, you may or may not want to follow this advice. Um, I'm a big proponent of caffeine for getting more done. And if you do the math on how much more work you get done if you sleep seven hours instead of eight hours a day, um, and you can do that without losing productivity, I mean, you get like extra work weeks every year. And, and then if and you, then take, you, that to its, if you take that to its logical conclusion, you, if you sleep four hours a night instead of eight, you're like getting an okay, extra year. Okay. So I'll stop promoting <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, excessive yeah, yeah, consumption yeah, yeah. of Red Bull. 
<laughs> Not, it's college students. They all drink it anyways. Um, just don't mix it with vodka. Um, <laughs> bad for your heart. Um, but it, there's these little things, and okay, sleep maybe is one that isn't a good idea, but there's these little things that you can pick up mm -hmm. that will just make you a little bit, a little bit simpler, right? Like it, there's another, there's a, a book called Getting Things Done, David Allen, GTV, that is, it's basically a cult, so fair warning, but it's all about productivity hacks. And if you look at this book, it's a collection of little hacks. There's nothing like overarching about it that is really that different, but it's these tiny little things that will just take one piece of mental load off of you. Right, and one of the classic examples there is like if you have to remember to bring something with you in the morning, leave it in front of the door before you walk out, like before you go to bed. So you like trip over it walking out, and all of a sudden you don't realize how expensive it is to have these background processing in your head that's like, don't forget that, don't forget that. Wake up in the middle of the night, I'm going to forget it. If you just if you do one of these things every day, mm -hmm. your life just gets less and less filled with friction. I have lots of one percent hacks that have nothing to do with coding. I am a huge believer in sending thank you notes, right? I mean, sending one thank you note is a 1% thing that you yep. do every day, and it has a huge, huge benefit. Meeting one more person, right? That's a 1%. Mm. I meet one more person, and all of a sudden, it might multiply because then I meet their friends, I meet their friends, um, things like that. So I think there, I, there are 1% hacks that have nothing to do with coding. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah, this is yeah. true of everything in life. Like, there's always little ways, to, and again, that's. That's not to say that there aren't big discontinuous changes that you yeah, need yeah, to yeah. make, mm -hmm. right? And like I would imagine law school as an example is, is not a 1% thing. Like you don't decide to learn 1% of the law every day. Like it's one actually- law day, but One law day. <laughs> one law day might work, but like you actually have to go to law school at some point and that's a big thing. And it's, my guess is it's been quite successful, quite helpful for you and it's been for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So it's not that there's no value in discontinuous changes, but this little kind of improve every day thing can help yeah. in, a lot, in a lot of realms, not just engineering. I would say my favorite one of those is listening to audiobooks while I exercise, right? Because it's like you're getting exercise, you're helping improve your longevity and your health, Steve. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and you're also getting knowledge w of whatever topic that you want. So for me, that's a 1%. That's a Great. So in a minute, I'm going to open it up to the audience, and I'm going to let you ask your burning questions so you can start thinking about that. Um, and I want to use this as an opportunity to sort of look at the flip side. Um, yes, we all have superpowers, but I think we also have fatal flaws, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we all know that um, we sometimes are incompetent at knowing we're incompetent. And how do you figure out where your flaws are and how to fix them? What's the best way to, to address that? Well, I just came off of an interesting experience. So for those of you who are familiar with the touchy-feely class at Stanford, uh, Interpersonal Dynamics, uh, I just it, you can take it after Stanford, lo and behold, which I found out recently. And the minute that I, I found that out, I signed myself up. Uh, and I took a class where it was me, essentially, and, and eight startup founders and leaders uh, in a room for an entire weekend and got really transparent feedback about my flaws. Uh, and I think that it's... And everyone in that room did, and everyone was really open to it. And for me, I've discovered actually that I think along with learning, one of my strengths is getting a lot of feedback and responding very quickly to feedback. And the way that I do that is by soliciting a lot of feedback and actually asking people. You know, you never realize you work so closely with people all the time, and you think, oh, you know what they think of you. But actually, if you just sit down and say, OK, you know what, screw performance reviews, screw the feedback cycle, Steve, how can I work better with you? And you know what? We don't have to talk about it in this one-on-one. -on -one. Can you come back next week and actually put some thought into it and tell me what are three things I can do to make our working relationship better um, and to help you do your job more easily? You'll learn so much more. People are really nice in performance reviews because they know that it matters for your career and they want, they want to help you. But if you actually ask, for feedback, you'll get some really honest answers. And you'll get answers like, I need you to back off of one of this area because I'm actually trying my hardest. And you know, I need you to understand that I'm doing as much as I can do. And those types of answers in context and in situations, I personally find to be so much more helpful than just generic statements about, oh, you, know, you are this way, as opposed to you have a particular behavior that if you changed would make our working relationship much better. So just to follow up, so when you get this feedback, is it pretty straightforward to fix it? I mean, those were things that were very tactical, like 
you know, can you back off? Were there any feedback that you got that was felt like it was very personal about you that you thought, wow, that's that's who I am. That's going to be something that's really difficult to change. It's possible. I, I think there are multiple ways to take feedback, right? You can take it as that's who I am. And I think there are people who can give feedback in a way that is hurtful. And so hopefully, <laughs> people will give you feedback, not in a way that is hurtful. Um, but I think you have to trust someone enough to give you feedback and then to take it and say, OK, they're not, uh, you know, they're not insulting my personality. They're talking about a couple of behaviors. And they're talking about, I mean, someone gave me feedback recently and, and said, you know, like, this is within, like, I don't know you outside of work. Like, this is just feedback within work. I am specifically not talking about your personality overall. I'm talking about, like, these specific behaviors. Um, and that's, that's really helpful. And I think you need, like, you can ask for that. But then you can also mentally talk yourself into, this person doesn't know all of me. Let me vet that feedback with others. For example, one of the pieces of feedback I got this weekend that I'm totally comfortable sharing is that uh, my emotional range seemed very seemed very limited in these interactions. That I had sort of one cadence, mm -hmm. and right, and Steve, yeah. I don't I, I don't know if, if you know me well enough for this, but when I shared it with people who I'm close to, and when I shared it with my team at work, they said, "What you? <laughs> you, know, you get really excited, and you also you know get disappointed, and you're not afraid to show when you're disappointed, and you're you know you're pretty human in, in who you are." And so just being aware, too, of the context and vetting out feedback with other people can help you not take it as personally. And then to follow up with questions. You said that, you know, what were the situations that caused you to, to say that feedback? How would you have liked to see me behave differently? What suggestions do you have for things that I can do and things that I can change? Um, I think part of the reason I'm good at responding to feedback is because I treat it as almost like user research and user design, <laughs> user design of, great, how many questions can I ask to understand the whole scope of what's going on here? I think for a lot of people, they would think that's a very brave thing to do, you know, to ask for feedback, because you might hear something you actually don't want to hear that's hard to hear. <clears throat> so what do you think? I, I think that's right, and I think that's the point. I think actually, in a funny way, what you want to hear when you ask for feedback, if you're doing it right is maybe not the right word, but if, if you're doing it right, then you want to get stuff you don't want to hear. Because if all you hear is stuff that you want to hear, then like, it's, it's nice to get praise. It's not that helpful, right? Like You actually want stuff that's hard to hear because it's actually the hard stuff to, to work on that's impacting you. I have a slightly different, uh, not a different um, approach to it, but maybe something to add on to Juliet's theory for this. I think there are people whose superpower is doing this very well. Um, and particularly, um, they tend to, take, tend to take roles or t should take roles as executive coaches. And I've worked with... I think it's tough when you build and run an organization to get feedback very, very consistently because everybody there works for you in some capacity and so you get less honest. That's not to say you don't and there are people who are really good at, at sort of giving feedback to people they work for. Um, but I think it's harder mm -hmm. I, or maybe I just suck at it and this is one of my fatal flaws. Uh, either way, the way I've found to mitigate this is by hiring an executive coach whose superpower is to go around and get this feedback and then frame it in a way that is not personal, but is also not taking the edge off it, right? Because what you want is somebody who can go through and say, hey, here's all the stuff. In their head, this person made this very personal attack. And I'm going to reframe that to something which is not like, it's OK, don't worry about it. But it's also not personal. It's, it's here's what I think they're trying to say. And here's you know, some ways you can start to think about working on it. Um, it also gives you a nice hack for accountability, because you have somebody who can help hold you accountable to the changes you're trying to make. Um, which can be really hard because these are, these are behaviors you've adopted because they worked for you for the last 10 years of your life. You know, it's interesting. I'm just going to push back on one thing you said because you said praise isn't useful. I would say that praise is really useful in parallel with, with feedback about what you can prove because that helps you understand what you do really well. I think right? that's right. Right. So, yeah. yeah. But if, you're, if you already know what you're good at, the, then the feedback is, is helpful. I think that's right. Great. So I'm curious. Anyone have a question? In the audience. OK, right over here. Stand up, please. Um, I had a question for uh, Jeff. Um, Steve. Steve. <laughs> That's his middle name. J, J, J name, but the guys, so we're cool. We'll both answer. Sorry. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the methodology of uh, continuing uh, and just keeping going, which you kind of point to as your superpower. I wanted to ask you how do you balance that with uh, a mindset of failing fast when something like actually isn't working and it's wasting time to, to keep going? Um, like, is, Are there times when that clouds your vision uh, when you should actually stop and try something? So I'm going to repeat it. So yep. the question is, OK, endurance is great, but sometimes if you're failing, you should just give up and say, you know what, let's, let's sort of uh, count our losses and do something different. Like, when does endurance get in the way? Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a very insightful question. And um, I, I think there's something to be said there about, to Tina's point about not only superpowers, but fatal flaws. There's also generally this concept, right, of your biggest strength also is potentially your biggest weakness. And I, th I think fundamentally I struggle with that a lot, which is it's really easy to keep going and put your head down. And it's for me, it's very hard to, to cut my losses early because I'm like, ah, if I just try harder, I can probably make it work. And like nine times out of 10, I can. And the 10th time, I waste a lot more time doing it. Um, I think it's something I have become more and more aware of over time and something I try to be thoughtful about. The biggest way I've found to do that is through... Um, basically like talking to kind of friends and mentors and call it like outside people because it, it lets me divorce the pain from the like, is this likely to succeed or not? Because they're not experiencing the pain generally of me of, of kind of pushing on for whatever it is. Um, and they can either say like, no, the, yeah, it looks like you're almost there or, you know, no, you're really, this is hopeless, get out. And I know I'm not bailing because like, oh man, this is really hard because they don't care it's hard. So, but but it's hard and it's a, it's it's something I've I've made that mistake many times in pursuing things longer than I should have. Interesting. What do you think? Uh, so I'm curious, Steve. When you, when you say that, I think with every good idea, there I I usually find that there are about 50% of people who are constantly who will always say this won't work. And you know, may, if you're lucky, you get 50% of people who will say this will work. But there. Are, there always are people, regardless of how good the idea is, when it's early enough, who will tell you, no, throw in the towel. So how, when you're relying on other people rather than yourself for that guidance, how do you distinguish between those? I, so I think it's really important you don't rely on them. You just look for it as another signal okay. and say, you know, hey, how am I feeling about this? And how are these people <laughs> reacting? And it can't, it can't be one. And, and by the way, that I don't know if this is the right answer because I'm still not good at this, but it's made me a little bit better at it. Um, I think you look at you know, five or 10 people and you have track records and you say, hey, are these people good at evaluating this? It's a little bit, um, it, it's really important to frame the question correctly, right? So it's not like, is this idea a good idea or not? Like in the case of a startup, in my experience, like nine out of 10 people are gonna tell you it's a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. and, and the general thinking there is that if it was already good, it would have happened and somebody else would have done it. And so it's pretty logical that most people are gonna think it's a bad idea. So that's a slightly different one. But in the sense of like, I'm in this situation, is my current, kind of course and speed going to carry me through to where I want to go, I think you can frame it in a way that more people will give you better <laughs> answers, but it's still more of a judgment call, right? And once that, maybe once that balance shifts to like 90% of your friends are saying like, what are you doing? You know, you're, it's maybe more time to pull the ripcord mm -hmm. than when, you know, just a couple people are naysaying. It's also important, by the way, that you get people who care enough about you, but not too much. Like your parents, pretty bad for this. You know, it's quite interesting. I find that all the time. Yeah. You know, that, that it's better to ask people who are not so close to the situation that they, um, their judgment is actually clouded. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think there was another question. Yes. Uh, so what if you have a passion or an interest in a field that uh, your superpower is not necessarily in the hard skills? Do you think that you can still succeed in that field? And if so, which roles or what kinds of things would you suggest focusing on until you're able to get to a stage where the soft skills kind of trump the hard skills that you need to get to the next level? Okay. So the question is, there are often times where you're passionate about something, but you might not have the skills yet to actually contribute to that field. Um, what are the soft skills or the other opportunities in that discipline that allow you to get your foot in the door as you're building those other skills? That's a fantastic question. Um, definitely soft skills become more and more important as you move further in your career, right? And there's a, there's a point at which it flips, and they're far more important than the hard skills are. Um, I think it is, the hard skills don't necessarily need to be your superpower, but getting those will make your soft skills so much more credible. So for example, 
I remember being told uh, when I was in college that I should get the hardest engineering degree that I possibly could. And I didn't. I designed my own. And I regret that. I regret not digging deeper into hard engineering skills. And it's not that it would have been my superpower, and I always knew that it wouldn't. But I think if you have those soft skills to layer on top of it, you will always have opportunities to exercise those soft skills because life tests your soft skills each and every day. And if you have at least a certain level of credibility in harder skills, you'll be able to get past that period. And then your soft skills will start to shine really quickly. So if I were you, I would encourage you to go at getting those hard skills. Be really diligent. Work hard. It's going to be a slog. And then allow your soft skills to shine from there. That would be my advice, uh, some of which I, I took and some of which I didn't. You know, it's interesting, that's sort of uh, the model that often gets floated around of the T-shaped person, the person who has a depth of knowledge in at least one discipline, but the breadth of knowledge and the skills that allow you to work across disciplines. So it's about thinking of yourself as a T-shaped person uh, that allows you to really be successful. What do you think? I agree. I think there's a lot to be said for, for acquiring some of the hard skills, even if they're not your superpower, just to have credibility and knowledge. Um, I also think there's a lot to be said for, I, I, I can't think of off the top of my head any problem areas or fields where the soft skills aren't also quite important. Mm -hmm. And so they might not be as glamorous or as exciting in the early days of something, right? Um, but you can almost always find a way to help and that gets you involved and that gets you both building the hard skills and also more and more kind of expertise in that area so that as you get deeper into your career, you have more and more, right? And so you can get into classic kind of you know, you're starting a technology company in Stanford, we're in the technology ventures program. And it's like, well, you know, what does somebody who's not writing code do in the first year of a software company? There's a lot, right? Now, that doesn't mean you need five people who don't have engineering degrees and one engineer, because that doesn't work out that well. But there's a lot of stuff to do. And I don't mean like kind of dumb stuff, right? Like, you know, like, yes, you need to get an office and get benefits set up and administrative stuff, but there's actually, there's user research, there's partnership conversations, there's fund, there's a bunch of stuff that needs soft skills. You can find a way to help. Um, and then over time, as the company grows, there's even more and more need for soft skills. And the more that you have hard skills, I, I would say even in that role, hard skills are really important because you'll be so much credi more credible with engineering teams and you'll actually understand the pain and problems that they're going through and you'll be able to better take back, say, user research or fundraising feedback in, in a way that's useful to the team. So yeah. hard skills are always helpful. So I think back over my long career, and your short careers, I'm sure that there have been people who've been incredibly encouraging and some who've been discouraging. Can you think of examples of someone at a pivotal moment who said something or did something that really allowed your, your passions and your superpower to blossom because they did or said something at just the right time that really allowed that to happen? Or on the flip side, someone who did just the opposite. There's someone for me that comes to mind immediately. Uh, so when I was at Opower, I was uh, working in product in the, the core area of the company's product and having a great time working with a really awesome team. And then someone came to me and said, do you want to join my team? I'm on the innovation team, and we're going to be exploring a new market. Well, here's my, here's my like, rough idea for it in two sentences. That's basically all I got. What do you think? And I went around and I talked to various folks within the company and every single person said it will be the opportunity of a lifetime for you to work for him. And they said part of that was because he had such a strong superpower in being an idea person. He was a really strong innovator. He could see opportunities, but he wasn't very good at making them definite and bringing them to concreteness. I, I once had the opportunity to talk with Vinod Kosla about this, and he used an analogy that I really like, which is you know, there are people who define Mount Everest and what that grand vision is. And then there are people who define what base camp is and what, the pa how, what base camp looks like, how to get from here to base camp, and then have some idea of how you're going to get from base camp to the top of Mount Everest. And he gave me the opportunity to pair with him so that I could define what that base camp was and then help us get up there and help us get up to the top of the mountain. And for me, that was a pivotal moment because it showed me that that is the area that I really like, that I'm not going to be the person who's defining Mount Everest. That's not my superpower. But if we've got an idea, 
I can define base camp and have the hunger and drive and endurance to go after and get it. And that was really pivotal for me just because he saw that spark in me that that would be something that I could do and encouraged me to go and explore something new. And I, ultimately, I think that's what great managers and leaders do is they're able to see what an individual person might be great at, give them an opportunity to go and, and shine in that area. So I have a lot of gratitude great. for that. Um, I, I have some similar, and I've had a lot of people who are very encouraging, but the one that comes to mind, ironically, when you mentioned that was the opposite, was somebody who was very discouraging, but triggered I guess what I think was my superpower. Um, about <laughs> eight, eight years ago, I was in a bad motorcycle crash out on Highway 9. Um, and I was riding along with some friends. And a about 16-inch thick eucalyptus tree fell on my head. And I woke up. I was unconscious. And they thought I was dead for a while. And I woke up. And, and my, one of my buddies was like, dude, a tree fell on you. And I was like, that's really embarrassing. I rode my bike into a tree. He said, no, 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 it actually fell on you. And it was like a, it was like a cartoon. Like it closed on me as I rode past. Worst part of this whole story is he was wearing a helmet cam, but it was out of memory. So always change your memory cards on your helmet cam. Um, so anyways, I got airlifted to Stanford. Um, it turned out that this tree had ripped two nerves off my spine. And so I couldn't use my left arm for a while. It, like literally just wouldn't move. It just kind of hung there. And I was um, training for Ironman at the time. And I was having this conversation with this, I think he was a med student or maybe a resident at Stanford. And I said like, hey, like, I got to get back to training, not really realizing how serious this was. Like, when can I start running again? And this guy's like, are you kidding me? You're never going to run again in your life. And my immediate reaction was like, F you. <laughs> what do you know? You're just a doctor. <laughs> and I got stubborn very quickly and did a bunch of research and, and, and um, found these guys up in uh, Rochester, Minnesota, who can reattach nerves. Went through a bunch of surgeries, blah, 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 and about a year later finished my first Ironman post-accident. And I finished it uh, significantly faster than I'd PR'd previously before I got injured. And then went on to run longer and longer races. And uh, I never got the doctor's name to go back and follow up with him. Um, <laughs> but in a funny way, I actually really owe him a thank you, in a sense, because it, it literally, like, the reaction was very immediate and like, no. Like, I'm going to prove you wrong, not only because it's my life and I want to you know, have use of my arm again, but because like you said, I couldn't do it. Wow. Mm. <laughs> That's what an amazing so, story. It was, that, it was, is, uh, that is like, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't deserve clapping. It, it sure just, does. It sure does. That's um, amazing. But what endurance and it was persistence. School stubbornness. And stubbornness. That's so great. Do we have another question? Yes, over here. In that vein, uh, what is it? that encourages you to become 1% better in something that you might already be the best at in your company? And then as leaders, how do you encourage other people to do that as well? So the question is, how do you motivate yourself to get 1% better even when you already are the best at what you do in your organization? Ultimately, for me, it comes down to what, what your goal is, right? Like if your goal is just to get better as a person, I, I think that's a good, good goal for sure. Um, but ultimately, when I'm on a team, my goal is helping our team achieve whatever our team's goal is. And so I might be the best in the company, but that is completely irrelevant. What's relevant is how can I be the absolute best in helping go after what our, what our goal is. Uh, and so I think always having that benchmark is really important uh, and can, mo can motivate you, and particularly can motivate members of your team as well. I've been fortunate that I've always been a member of teams that have a really clear mission and a really clear vision, and that that can always be used to inspire people. You know, every all hands and every every team meeting, it's always about what the broader goal is and how we're going to, about getting there. Um, and I think the best way to align yourself to improve is if it's not just in the service of yourself, but it's if, if it's in the service of a broader team goal. I, I think that's a really good answer and purpose and mission. I also think there's a set of people who are just intrinsically motivated to self-improve because that's fun, entertaining. I don't know exactly what. Like, I find that way. I just I like improving because I just there's something inside my head that's OCD that's kind of like, oh, I'm 1% faster today. Like That's a good thing. Um, I don't know how you teach that or, or build that in an organization other than through hiring. Um, at Hearsay, we focused a lot on hiring people who were who thought that way and who just kind of were, were believers in continuous improvement for the sake of 
just getting better. Like it was a noble goal. One of the guys I work with um, said it really, really well, and I quote it all the time. Is Mark Gilbert um, said that uh, perfection is the goal, but it's not the destination. Meaning that like you're never actually going to get there, so you, you there's no finish line. Like you just keep going, but that's kind of part of the fun part. Like how boring would it be if you didn't need to improve anymore and you just sat there? I, but I don't know how you teach that to an org. I think it's I think you largely drive that through mission and purpose, as opposed to just telling people to get better. Okay, so I'm going to ask the last question. So I want you to flash back to when you were a student here, whether it's 11 years, 14 years ago that you were sitting here, and to think what you wish you knew when you were back here as a student. So I've got one. Uh, I. I think there's this notion that you have when you're at Stanford that the world is your oyster. And to a large extent, it is, right? It is something that you can take advantage of because there are so many opportunities and so many opportunities to contribute. But I also think there's this notion that life is going to be up and to the right, you know, the same as startup returns are. And you're going to go, and you're going to get the perfect job after you graduate, and you're going to have figured out what you want to do. And I think what's the most beautiful about finding your superpower and also finding out what you're really called to do is that it's a really messy process. And if you want, you can be methodical about this messiness. I've, uh, I haven't read that much of designing your life, but I read sort of 20% of it enough to, to get the gist. Uh, and I think that the idea of testing out different areas and deciding which one of them is going to be most suitable for you is a really good one. Uh, the problem is that. When you find out that an area isn't the area that you want to go into, you have a moment that, where you have to pivot. And pivots are not, they're not easy if you're a startup. They're probably just, just as hard, if not harder, if you're a person. And I think pivot is a nice word for what this feels like. I prefer Ben Horowitz's uh, WIFIO acronym, uh, which stands for We're Fucked, It's Over. Tina told me I could swear. <laughs> and and it, feels like, it feels like we're fucked, it's over, right? It's a really harrowing moment where you think, I was on this path, and this is what I was going to do, and this was going to be my identity, and oh, crap, it did not work out. What am I going to do now? And those moments feel the scariest, but they don't mean that you're doing it wrong. They mean that it, you're doing it right. They mean that you tried something so hard that you really could get a great insight into whether it was right for you or not. You gave it a solid go. And this applies to all aspects of, of your life. Uh, and then when you're able to pivot from that and say, OK, what do I learn from this? And how does it make me stronger? That's where the biggest growth opportunity happens, is it happens in those moments. One of my favorite meditation teachers says that you know, in meditation, the actual part of meditating is when you figure out that you're screwing up and your mind is getting off in your thoughts. And then you bring yourself back to your thoughts. That's meditating. And that is life. And that is learning, too, in the we're fucked, it's over moments, where you're realizing that you've screwed it up and you need to find another path. And what's that path going to be? And how are you going to get there? And so you know, Stanford makes a lot of things really easy for us. I definitely felt like Stanford was a nice and easy and, and safe environment. Uh, and the real world can be that way, but it also can be more challenging. And, and endurance and perseverance help, but so does an attitude of willing to learn through whatever life throws at you and, and being willing to pivot through those moments. Thank you. I think that's, yeah, I think that's awesome. And, and the, the way I would, the, add on to that, I would say is don't take it so seriously. <laughs> like life is a game. And I, I find like, when I was here, I was so worried about what was next and was I maximizing everything and was I improving my 1% a day? And was I going and, and I just, the, the more I go through stuff, the more I just kind of like let go a little bit. And it doesn't mean you don't work really hard and it doesn't mean you don't learn a ton of stuff and it doesn't mean you don't go through really hard stuff because sure, that's absolutely right. Like, the more of those you go through, the more fun it is at some level. Um, and, and at some point, you begin to embrace the suck and just like, you know, this is hard and we're fucked, it's over. And oh, wow, OK, I feel that. That's comfortable. I'm, I'm there again. Like, what do I do next? But it's it, like, enjoy it. Like, just go through it and have fun and relax a little bit. That doesn't mean, you know, go like smoke weed in Tahoe all year. But um, it's, it's, that's not as bad as cursing, right? No, no. OK. <laughs> 
And it's but legal. It's, it's legal. Okay, That's okay. Right. It's legal. legal. Okay, okay I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, no, but it's, it's, it's not, that's not to say, you know, don't, don't work hard. Don't, don't try to excel all these things, but like, just enjoy the whole thing and realize that like, there's a bit of chaos to this all. Right. And I, I've, I've read just enough chaos theory to know the name and, um, it's true. Like it makes sense. Everything's kind of chaotic and you can be the most put together, planned out, methodical, intense type A person and like the optimal Stanford student, like genetically engineered Stanford student. <laughs> and it won't all work mm -hmm. and that's okay like the most interesting uh, some of the best things i've done in my life have been things i did merely for the reason that it seemed like it would create a good story <coughs> and like sure enough it did create a good story but it actually turned out to be really fun and memorable whether or not i ever told that story to anybody um because it was just fun so that is so wonderful please join me in thanking our fabulous guests <laughs>